So uh, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Thank you everyone for coming out today. My name is Mark Tidwell. I'm the Dean of Clinical Education at the Oregon College of Learning Medicine. How many of you have heard of OCOM? Okay, so about half of you. Okay, OCOM is uh, sometimes called the best kept secret in uh, complementary and alternative medicine in the Portland area. But in fact, OCOM has been around for uh, over 25 years. Um, and we have been up until just recently um, in our location on Cherry Blossom Boulevard in Southeast near Mall 205. But in fact, we're moving our main campus location just two blocks away from here at 75 Northwest Cooch. Uh, there's a picture. We actually purchased the old Globe Hotel building and we renovated it and we have a new state-of-the-art facility that we're moving, in, moving our main campus to. So we're gonna have um, our uh, main clinic and classrooms at this location will maintain a presence in southeast near Mall 205 where we currently are. We also have a, a clinic in Hollywood, in the Hollywood district. So um, just wanted to give a little pitch. We're down here in the neighborhood and we're really excited about being here. So um, anyone that happens to live in this area or live close, close by, keep this in mind when you're uh, thinking about acupuncture and oriental medicine services, okay? So um, today I'm gonna talk about pulse diagnosis in the context of Chinese medicine. And what I'm gonna discuss today is just some basic information about Chinese medicine. I'm gonna present what I think is uh, the most important thing that you need to understand about Chinese medicine generally. Okay, so that's going to be an important takeaway message from this presentation. Um, I will go over the history of pulse diagnosis in Chinese medicine briefly, um, talk about some of the, the main uh, texts in pulse diagnosis, some of the, the main uh, writers, and, and what those texts um, dealt with in terms of pulse diagnosis. I'll spend a little bit of time talking about you know, how we do pulse diagnosis, why we do it, um, what's significant about it, what we look for. Okay? And finally, at the very end, I'm going to spend, uh, we'll spend some time together uh, feeling uh, pulses and getting a sense of some of the basic characteristics. Um, it, it, it isn't hard if you know a few things to look for to get a basic sense of what's going on with, uh, with someone's pulse. So at the very end, we'll spend some time. Uh, Beth is going to be our, our pulse model. Um, and um, I'll go ahead and feel her pulse. And then I'll let each of you feel her pulse and um, give you some guidelines about what to, what to feel for. And we're going to report back and get a sense of, of what uh, what's going on with Beth in terms of her pulse and see how, how, how well we can, we can uh, discern uh, what's, what's happening with her, okay? So, first off, how, how many of you are, are familiar with, with oriental medicine, Chinese medicine, to some degree? Okay, so most everyone has some, some, some familiarity with it. So I have a question. What do you think makes Chinese medicine unique? History. Definitely. What about its history? You think is, is unique about it? Ancient. Yes. Yeah. And in fact, we're not even certain exactly how long. We know that um, in terms of the, the written record, it goes back, you know, 2,000 or more years. But there are archaeological records that go back much early, and and quite likely, we're talking thousands, probably more than 5,000 years. And I would say even as much as 9,000 years, perhaps. That's speculation of how long this has been going on. What else? Um, it works with the energy in the body, with the meridians and the acupressure mm -hmm. points, points, which Western medicine doesn't uh, use at all. Yeah. Yeah, so we, we often talk about Chinese medicine uh, being an, an energetic medicine. So it works you know, very much in, in, in terms of, of the, this notion of what we call qi in, China, in, in, in Chinese, the term is called qi, qi uh, in Japanese, right? And it, it uh, is sometimes it's translated as vital energy, 
there are different translations for it, but it's certainly sort of the sustaining life force of the entire universe. Okay, it's what sustains uh, life and form in the entire universe and in our bodies. Right? So that's something that, that certainly is, is uh, interesting, uh, distinctive about Chinese medicine. I think it's much more interactive than uh, Western medicine. More listening to the patient and more uh, more working together or something. That's what I associate with. Yeah, I would say that generally, I mean, there, you know, there is, it's, it's, it's a medicine that um, does really try and listen, okay, and pay attention to what's going on with the person um, on a lot of different levels. And we're going to talk about some of the, 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 the points of diagnosis in addition to the pulse diagnosis and, and how that, uh, that informs uh, what we do in our, our practice. But I want to say a little bit about this here. You know, do you think acupuncture is something that's distinctive about Chinese medicine? I think it's Eastern. Mm -hmm. I love it. I consider it non-invasive and non-prescriptive mm -hmm. compared to Western. I drift that way. Okay. Now, I'm, I'm, I'm sort of setting you up here, okay? <laughs> because I'm, I'm asking about all these different modalities. These are all mo modalities or methods of treatment within Oriental medicine or Chinese medicine. Most people in the West, when they think of acupuncture, uh, Chinese medicine, Oriental medicine, they think of acupuncture. But in fact, we have herbs as a very important part of, of our medicine. Uh, moxibustion, which is the burning of a particular type of herb for warming or thermal heat therapy. Okay, uh, cupping. Some of you, I'm sure, have had cups. Okay, we introduce, you know, uh, fire into a glass cup. You put it on the body, create suction, and gets the chi and the blood moving, right? And certainly, we have forms of massage. Toina is a form of Chinese massage. Uh, uh, shatsu is a Japanese form of oriental med medical massage. Okay, but all of these things, I would say, are not necessarily what makes uh, Chinese medicine unique. Acupuncture, in fact. You have uh, Western doctors that practice acupuncture. Okay, they stick needles in people. Okay, they don't, however, practice them according to the same principles that we practice the ancient principles of our medicine. Okay, that's not to say that what they do is wrong or bad, but it is different. But they still say that they practice acupuncture. They practice medical acupuncture. We practice uh, something that's that's different. Anything that we do in terms of herbs, acupuncture. Massage is going to be based on our ancient principles of the medicine. Okay, I will say one other thing about acupuncture, which is interesting. They've come across uh, a, a, a mummified remain. This is back around 2000 in the Tyrolean Alps, okay, between Italy uh, and, and Austria. And this, uh, they, they, to the best uh, uh, of their uh, the tools that they have, they, they, they think this is about, uh, this person lived about 9,000 years ago. And what they found were um, tattoos along certain lines of the body. Okay, and, and, and they have a certain correspondence to certain acupuncture points that we understand you know, today. Okay, and what, what uh, we think may have happened with this ancient mummified person is back in the day, they actually had a form of acupuncture. And it's possible that acupuncture may not have developed in China. Or, and, and it may not have developed in China, but it moved to China and the Chinese kept it going. Or it's possible it developed in different places uh, in, the, in the world separately. Cupping, in fact, is a type of, of therapy that you will find in multiple parts of the world that develop independently of, of Chinese culture. Okay, so I just want to put that out there. The point is, acupuncture, herbs, moxibustion, cupping, massage, all of these things, these modalities of Chinese medicine are distinctive, but they're not what makes Chinese medicine unique. Okay?
What makes Chinese medicine unique is ultimately its approach to diagnosis. Okay? One could say, in, in a bigger sense, its whole approach to the world. It is a naturalistic medicine, okay? and it sees everything as interconnected. Right? So, the planets, the stars, have a connection to the earth. The insects, the trees, all the animals have a connection to each other. And all of this has a connection to us as human beings. We're interconnected. Okay? And every part of the human body is interconnected as well. Okay? So I would say that the thing that makes Chinese medicine distinctive is its approach to diagnosis. And I'm going to talk a little bit more detail now about what that means specifically. We have here two symbols. We all know what this symbol is, right? Supreme Ultimate Tai Chi, yin yang symbol, right? Okay. This is representative of ultimately the the Chinese worldview. Okay. Who knows what this symbol is? Actually, it's it's not Caduceus. They look similar. This is called the rod of Asclepius, and in fact, they're confused. The Caduceus is the symbol associated with Hermes, okay, the messenger in Greek mythology. The rod of Asclepius is associated with Asclepius, who was the son of Apollo, and who was a healer. So in fact, when you see different uh, medical professions uh, using uh, this symbol, they're correct. If you see them using something that has two snakes with some wings on the side, it's actually bit of a mistake. But the point is, this is a symbol of Western medicine. One could say this is a symbol of Chinese medicine. And in Western medicine, when we go see a doctor, what do they do? Okay, when we go in, we complain we're not feeling well. They're going to draw some blood. Okay, they're going to do some exams, maybe put you know a scope in our body somewhere, do a scan, right? They will, they will uh, perform these different tests to determine what disease we have, right? And in Western medicine, it's the disease that's the most important thing, okay? And for them to diagnose a disease, you have to have shown some sort of either physical abnormality, okay, a tumor, a break, a fracture, something like that, or your blood work has to be abnormal, okay, something like that, or something in a scan that looks abnormal, okay, and if you go in to see a doctor and you're diagnosed with asthma or ulcerative colitis or Crohn's disease or any number of diseases, five different people with that disease are pretty much going to have the same, same kind of blood work the same kind of, of scan, something like that. They're all going to look the same, so they'll be diagnosed with the same disease, right? Chinese medicine emphasizes what we call pattern diagnosis, or patterns of disharmony. Okay? That doesn't mean that we disregard a disease. In fact, in Chinese medicine, traditionally, we have our own disease categories. Generally, what that means is a chief complaint. Okay? So, if you have a headache, in Chinese medicine, we believe that that's actually considered a type of disease. Or if you have constipation or diarrhea, you have a disease. Right? Those are considered diseases. Western medicine would say, headache, just a symptom. Constipation, diarrhea, just a symptom. Okay? But in Chinese medicine, traditionally, those were considered diseases. Now today, in modern Chinese medicine, we also understand that people suffer from modern diseases, diseases with names like asthma, ulcerative colitis, Crohn's disease, things like that. Okay, so we take all of that into consideration, but when two people come to us suffering from headache, or maybe a western disease called asthma, we're going to look at some other things that give us additional information. Okay, We're going to be looking at their tongues, 
We're going to be feeling their pulses. We're going to look at the, their eyes. We're going to look at their inflection. We're going to ask questions about their sleep and their energy. And if two people with the same disease come in and their tongues look different, their pulse feels different, their, their eyes are, you know, look different, their complexion looks different, their sleep is different, they have what we call different patterns of disharmony. And they're going to be treated differently. Okay? So a pattern of disharmony is an individual person's response to a disease. It's how each person responds to having a certain type of disease. Because we all know situations where two people will get treated for the same disease with the same treatment in Western medicine. One person improves, one person doesn't. Right? And from the perspective of Chinese medicine, why that happens is that Western medicine doesn't really take into account very well those subtle differences that each one of us has. Does that make sense? Okay. This is the single most important thing that you need to understand about what makes Chinese medicine unique. It is this notion of pattern diagnosis. So in fact, we do a disease diagnosis for everyone. You come into me with constipation or diarrhea or headache, I say you have the disease of headache or constipation or diarrhea. But I'm also going to be diagnosing you in terms of your unique pattern for that disease and treating you on the basis of the pattern. Okay? So, we have a saying. This is something that we all learn in, in school. Same disease, different treatment, different disease, same treatment. Okay? So, like I just said, two people come in with the same disease, a headache, but their tongues look different, their pulse feels is different, their sleep is different. We treat them differently. By the same token, it's possible that you know you could come in with you know a, a headache, you could come in with constipation, no headache, and yet your tongues look similar, your pulse feels similar. Your sleep is similar, etc., etc. We're going to treat you the same way, okay? So we really focus in Chinese medicine on this notion of the pattern of disharmony, okay? Is that clear? So I want you to, if, if you take anything away from this talk, that's what I'd like you to take away from it. That this is what is distinctive about Chinese medicine, okay? Any questions before we move on? Hope I haven't. Overwhelmed the way So, how do we diagnose in Chinese medicine? I mean, we've all had experiences with, with Western doctors, and they use a lot of, you know, these days in particular, a lot of high tech, you know, medicine. Now, some of you, if you've, you know, seen physicians who are trained, you know, maybe before 1960, you know, in the 50s or earlier, um, they actually practice a lot more like Chinese medicine doctors. They put their hands on you. They spend time feeling your body, palpating. Okay? They know how to do, you know, uh, use the stethoscope properly. A lot of, a lot of doctors today um, are not as well trained in, in some of these basics because they rely so much on high tech. Well, Chinese medicine has always been low tech. Okay? And it relies on what we call the four examinations to come up with its diagnosis. Okay? The four examinations are observation, listening and smelling, asking, and palpation. So, when someone comes in to see me for a treatment, the first thing I do is I'm observing them. I go out to the waiting room, I introduce myself, I say, hi, I'm Martin Kibble, I'm going to be treating you today. And I'm looking in your eyes, that's the first thing I do. I want to know what's going on with the state of your shen or your spirit. In the West, we have a saying, the eyes are the window to the soul, right? They tell us a lot about what's going on with someone, right? So the, the, the shen is very important. That's the first thing that I do. I look in someone's eyes. I want to know what the state of the person's shen is. I'm also looking at their complexion, okay? Is it pale? Is it red? Is it ruddy? Okay? I look at 
things like um, their gait. Are they limping? Are they hiked up like that? You know, that tells you something. As I'm walking back to the treatment room, you know, I'm walking, looking at how people are walking. And I look at the nails. The nails give you a lot of information about the state of someone's blood, in particular. All right. So observation is is one of the key pillars of diagnosis. Listening and smelling. Okay. Listening. Obviously, we listen to someone's voice. We want to know the voice can tell us the state of someone's chi, how strong it is. People with weak voices naturally have have weak chi, lung chi, as we call it. We'll listen to their breathing, okay? Are they breathing heavily? Do they have wheezing sounds? People with asthma, you can hear, if someone with bad asthma, you can hear the wheezing in their chest, right? Um, we'll listen to cough, okay? In Chinese medicine, no two coughs are the same. We treat a dry cough differently from a wet cough, and we've all probably had both. So you know the sound of a dry cough versus a wet cough. That's significant. There's also smelling. We don't do as much of that these days as in the past. In the past, there's actually a lot more. Actually, people, would, physicians would smell the urine, okay, and stir it up and smell it. Uh, we don't do that as much now. But I will tell you that can be distinctive. The smell of someone's breath can tell us a lot about what's going on in terms of their pattern. I had a patient just this past year who had uh, what's called diabetic ketoacidosis. Anyone know what that is? You ever smelled it? It's significant. People with very severe um, untreated diabetes, their kidney function can, can decline significantly, and their whole metabolism changes, so it, it, they, they start uh, burning fuel in, in, a, in a way that's, that's not healthy. And it, it creates a smell in their skin and in their breath. And I walked into that treatment room and I smelled it and I said, whoa, this person's you know, a severe, uh, has severe diabetes and that can be a very dangerous situation. So smelling can be very important in terms of my diagnosis. Okay? Asking, obviously. And you see any doctor, they're going to ask you lots of questions about you know, what's going on with your, your chief complaints your past medical history. And we ask lots of, of questions that you know, some people find, you know, maybe it'll say, wow, really, do you have to ask that? You know, but we ask lots of questions about people's bowel movements. Okay? Um, we ask lots of questions about people's urine. Okay? You know, what it looks like, you know, how it smells, all these things. And it's important for us because it gives us very, very um, important clinical information for coming up with a diagnosis. And finally, palpation. Palpation is one of the pillars as well of, of diagnosis in Chinese medicine. Palpation can include abdominal palpation, okay? And the Japanese have taken uh, this part of, of palpatory diagnosis and really elevated it to an art, okay? So Japanese medicine, traditional medicine, um, really emphasizes um, the uh, abdominal diagnosis using palpation of the abdomen. Okay. Chinese medicine, uh, Chinese medicine practitioners do it as well, but um, it's, it's not emphasized as much. We certainly palpate along the course of the different channels to get a sense of, of what's going on at different different locations. Okay. The other hallmark of um, palpatory diagnosis is the pulse. And that's what we're here to talk about today. Okay, so I'm going to get into that. The other one I just realized I didn't talk about in observation is tongue diagnosis. I wasn't sticking my tongue out at you. But tongue diagnosis is very important. Okay? So looking at the color of someone's tongue, looking at the size of it, whether it's big and swollen and puffy, or really thin and narrow and shrunken. Is it red? Is it pale? Does it have scallops at the edge? Is the coating thick or thin? Is the coating white or is it yellow or even brown or black? All of these things tell us uh, important pieces of information. Okay? But we're here today to talk about pulse diagnosis. 
Take care. Thanks. So, in the history of uh, Chinese medicine, this text, the Huang Yi Mei Jing, the Yellow Emperor's Eternal Classic, is considered kind of like the Bible of Chinese medicine. Okay, just to to consider that 2,000 years ago, we had a a text that laid down most of the the foundations, the theoretical foundations of our medicine. We still uh, use it today, and most subsequent uh, medical texts, you know, go back to the Neijing as as its source. Okay. As far as post diagnosis in the Huang Yi Neijing, back in those days, it was very it's different from the way we do it now. Okay. In the Neijing, they actually felt the pulse at nine different arteries in the body. Okay. So you had pulse diagnosis done on the head. Okay. Pulse diagnosis was actually done, you know, in the arms and also on the legs and down into the feet as well. And at each of these locations, you had three different. Uh, so from the head had three different arteries that were palpated. The arms had three different arteries that were palpated, and the legs had three different arteries that were palpated. The, the Neijing doesn't talk a lot about um, what these, the significance of these pulses are. You have to keep in mind the Neijing, you know, being written a long time ago, um, it, we're not even certain if it's entirely complete. Um, some of the information is is. Um, a little bit difficult for us to to to, um, to understand today, but the primary way that, that pulse diagnosis was described in the Neijing was as a way of giving a prognosis about someone's death. So when pulse diagnosis is described in Chinese medicine, the practitioner is usually saying this kind of a pulse means that the person will recover from their severe illness and not die, or this kind of a pulse means that the person is, uh, is beyond treatment and will pa pass away. Okay? So this is the, the first text that really talks about um, pulse diagnosis. During the Han Dynasty, we have a text called the Nanjing, the classic of difficulties. And the Nanjing established pulse taking at this location in the wrist Okay, right in here. The Neijing talks about uh, pulse taking at the wrist. Okay, but the Neijing also talked about all these other places and didn't give, you know, it, the priority to the wrist pulse. Okay, by the time we get to uh, the Nanjing and the Han Dynasty, this location right here at the wrist is where um, pulse taking settles. Okay. The other thing that's distinctive about the Nanjing is it starts to attribute organ and channel correspondences to these pulses here. So I mentioned earlier that Chinese medicine sees everything as interconnected, right? Well, it, what that means is that any one part of the body can be a reflection of the entire body, okay? So, Taking the pulse here at, this, at the radial artery, at the wrist, the Chinese believe that you can actually get a sense of what's going on with other parts of the body. Okay? So let me show you something here. These are just Chinese terms for these three locations. Essentially, what you have is right, if you all feel your own wrists, there's this bone here that's called the radius, okay? And if you feel right in this area, you feel kind of a bump just, just past the wrist crease, okay? Just about maybe half an inch or so, an inch from the wrist crease. Feel that bump there on the radius? Well, just past that bump is where you put your middle finger. We call it the guan position. All right, so we always feel for that little bump and to put our middle finger just past that point, okay? Then we put our index finger 
close, just closer to the wrist. Okay, and then finally we put the ring finger right there. And that's how we feel the pulse. And we do it on both sides. Okay? So we have these three positions, the tsun, the guan, and the chur. And they're felt at both on both hands, the right side and the left side. And the thinking is that that pulse, that position, can give you information about what's going on in the entire body. Okay, so in the Nanjing, the classic of difficulties, you can see that in the Tsun position, these are the organs that are felt. That's what, and, and the channels that are felt in this position. So we have the heart and the lung, large intestine, small intestine. Okay? The understanding here, hold, hold that thought. In the guan position, the understanding is that on the left side of the guan position, we feel the liver and the gallbladder energy. On the right side, we feel the spleen and the stomach energy. And what this means, don't, don't get confused about these terms. When we talk about liver, gallbladder, spleen, and stomach, we're not necessarily talking about the same thing that we understand in Westerners. Okay? These are terms that, that the ancient Chinese used more in a descriptive way of what was going on in our physiology and pathology in the body. So, when I say to someone, oh, your kidney energy feels weak, that doesn't mean you're a candidate for transplant or you're a candidate for dialysis. It doesn't mean that at all, okay? It means something very different. But the point here is that in a Tsun position, we tend to, to think of it as corresponding to everything from the diaphragm upwards, okay? So at the Tsun position, we can feel the energies the energy of the body from the diaphragm to the chest, into the head, even into the shoulders and arms. Okay? In the guan position, we're able to, to sense the energy that's going on from the diaphragm to the belly button. Okay? Sort of in this area. Alright? Finally, at the chur, what we call the chur position, we are able to sense the energies from the belly button downward, okay, even all the way down into the legs. Okay? So that's how the Nanjing broke things out as far as the pulse is concerned. Almost 200 years later, we have the Mai Jing, the pulse classic, by a practitioner called Wang Chu He um, is pictured right here. Wang Shu He was um, the, the first person to really do a detailed study of pulse. Okay, so the, the, the Mai Jing is the first detailed study of pulse and pulse diagnosis in the history of Chinese medicine. Okay? Um, Wang Shu He actually identified 24 different types of pulse. So he describes you know, at, at these different positions, he describes certain qualities or categories or characteristics of, of the pulse. And he says what those mean clinically, pathologically. So what does it mean if you feel the pulse at the surface versus deep? Okay? What does it mean if the pulse feels thin versus really wide? Okay, they mean different things. So he spent time thinking about this, studying it in his, in his practice, and writing it down. So in fact, we have in, in, the, in the Mai Jing, 24 different uh, pulses described. Okay? And, we, uh, and, and I will point out that he did something a little bit different in terms of, of how he looked at the correspondences of the different um, organs and channels. Okay. One of the things that he did differently was in this chair position. Okay? He said that, in fact, on both sides, the chair position corresponds to what we call the kidneys, the deep underlying energy of the whole body. Okay?
If we fast forward to the Ming Dynasty, we have uh, Li Shi Jian, who wrote this particular text called In Hu Study of the Pulse, or the Lakeside Pulse Masters Classic. Okay, that's another translation of this. And his text established the foundations for, for modern pulse taking today. So most of what we understand about pulse taking, at least in, in um, the Chinese tradition of oriental medicine, is based on this text. Okay? And he developed some additional pulse categories. In fact, he came up with 27. So these descriptions of different types of pulses and what they mean, he came up with 27. Today, there, there's different numbers, but generally we, we think of about 28 pulse categories. Okay? So, and, and most of them come from his text. One of the things that he also did differently is um, he tended to focus much more on these organs. Okay? He was much more of an herbalist than he was an acupuncturist. And he tended to focus uh, the importance of pulse taking much more on the yin organs of the body. Okay? You don't have to worry about all of that. The, the point is that it's just an evolution of the understanding of pulse taking. And ultimately, this is, when I feel a pulse, this is basically what I am feeling for. I'm feeling at the sun position on the left hand side, okay, so right there. I feel what's going on in the heart energy, the center of the chest. I also think of it as just everything that's going on from here upwards too. So sometimes I can feel if someone has a, a bad headache or pain, you know, in their head or shoulder or hand, I can feel that in the Tsun pulse. On the right side, the focus is more on the lungs and the center of the chest. If someone's having difficulty breathing, someone who's as asthmatic maybe, they got a tight chest, or maybe they're just stressed out and they're not breathing well, you know how we, that all happens when we're not thinking, we're stressed out, we get that kind of thing. I can feel that in the pulse, okay? In the guan position, once again, we feel on the left side the liver and the gallbladder energies, or what we call the spleen, the stomach, which is really just the digestion, the digestion. Okay. So on the right side, the guan, we feel the digestion. Okay. And it's quite distinctive. If someone has poor digestion, it's very common that you will feel in that right guan position that the pulse feels very weak, or maybe it feels very soft, okay? So that, that's very distinctive. And then finally, in the chur positions, you feel the energy of the kidneys, the kidney organ. And the kidneys in Chinese medicine are the underlying energy of the whole body, okay? It would include things like your, your basic constitution, maybe what we might in, in modern terms understand is our genetic makeup, okay? What you came into this world with, okay? So the kidneys are the deep underlying energy of the whole body that all the other organs draw their strength from. And at the chair position, that's what we're feeling, okay? And it's a little bit different from the left side to the right side. On the left side, this focuses much more on the yin and the blood, okay? These organs here are more associated with the yin and the blood on the left side. And on the right side, these organs are much more associated with the chi and the yang. Okay? All right. So what does the pulse reveal? We can feel in a pulse whether someone is running more hot or more cold. Okay? If, if their pulse is rapid, generally, not always, but generally that means that they have heat in the body. 
if their pulse is very slow, usually that means that we, that we think that they're running on the cool side or the cold side. Okay? We can also tell if someone uh, is more excess or deficient. Someone who's deficient, what kind of what, what's their pulse going to feel like? What do you think? Weaker, Weaker absolutely. Someone who's, who's very deficient, their pulse is not going to be strong. Someone who's, who's strong is going to have a full pulse, and when they get sick, it's even going to, it's going to get excess and feel really full. All right? We can tell where a disease is located by feeling the pulse. Okay? We can tell if it's more on the, uh, the superficial surface of the body. Generally, pulses that are felt just at the surface indicate that there's something going on pathologically at the superficial portions of the body. Whereas, if you feel the pulse very deeply, that usually means that whatever's going on with that person is generally deeper inside. Okay. Certainly, the pulse can tell us about the state of someone's chi, their blood, their body weight. You mentioned already, if someone's chi is weak, their pulse is going to feel weak. If they're deficient in blood or body fluids, their pulse is going to be really thin and generally very narrow. Okay? If, they're, if it's full of blood, full of fluids, okay, it's going to be nice and wide. Okay. Finally, I've already mentioned that pulse taking can tell us about the state of the organs and the channels of the body. Okay. So when we take the pulse, we have to ensure that there are the proper conditions and methods. The proper conditions are met and the proper methods are followed. You know, it doesn't help when someone is you know, rushing in to an appointment if they're hurried or if they've been in traffic and they're very angry. We want to give them time to calm down and settle down because that can distort the pulse and give an inaccurate reading. Okay? Um, we also want to follow established methods. And I'm going to talk about all of this in just a second. And finally, when we feel the pulse, Assuming that the proper conditions are met, and assuming that the practitioner is following the proper methods, we have to be able to translate what we feel into the traditional categories or images that have been laid down by you know, the teachers. Li Shu Jin, as I mentioned, had these 27 pulse images. Okay? And when we're feeling the pulse, we're thinking, oh, okay, it's uh, superficial and it's thin, okay, and it's rapid, that means blah, 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 blah. Okay, that's, that's what we do. Okay, so you can see here, these are the basic conditions or methods. The patient must be relaxed. It doesn't help if someone is stressed out, um, has been rushing uh, to the appointment, and you take their pulse immediately. That doesn't help. You have to give them time to settle down. You as a practitioner have also have to be calm and be able to concentrate. Okay. It's really important that the arms and the wrists of the patients are relaxed and no higher than, but generally below the heart. Okay? So usually when you go see a practitioner, you sit, you know, um, I usually have them sitting like this in a chair and just resting their hands in their lap like that. Okay? But a lot of practitioners will have little pillows. At the, at the table, and they'll just have you rest through your hands like that and feel them um, just like that. Okay? If, 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 the, if the arm is above the heart level, however, that's not, that's not good. That's not the best way to take a pulse. Okay, so I already mentioned where the, the fingers need to be placed, right? So if you're, if you recall, we put the guan, a uh, 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 middle finger at this guan position, which is just past that little bump that we feel on the radius. Okay? And then we put our index finger here at the tsun position and our ring finger at the chur position. Right? We make adjustments. If someone is really, uh, really short and small, 
Our fingers are going to be closer together, like that. They'll be right together. If they're really tall, they got really long arms, long legs, we might spread, spread the fingers out a little bit, like that. Okay? So we make a certain adjustments based on the size of the person, where the tsun, the guan, and the chu is. Does that make sense? Okay. The other thing that we do that, that's important as far as the method of pulse taking is we actually have our, our, our fingers in kind of an arch like this. So when I'm feeling the pulse, I'm actually got these three fingers in a bit of an arch. I'm not like that, I'm not like that, but just, just about like that, okay? The other thing it says here, the fingertips are kept on the same horizontal level. What does that mean? What it means is, if you, if you can see, it may not be easy to see, but you want the index, the middle finger, and the ring finger all to be at about the same level. You don't want the ring finger to be up like that, excuse me, the middle finger to be up like that, and the ring finger and, and the index finger to be like that, nor do you want it like this, okay? So this means horizontal level, okay? They're all at the same level. So you have a little arch, and they're all at the same level, just like that. That's the proper method for taking, taking the pulse. Appro uh, applying the right amount of pressure, and that can be challenging, okay? When you feel the pulse, or when I feel the pulse, what I like to do initially, on each side, I will apply pressure with all three. So I'll go like this, I'll go from the surface, to the middle, to the deep level. I'm exaggerating, but I push all the way down with all three fingers, the same pressure. I just want to get a general sense of what's going on overall, not at the individual positions, but overall on that side. Okay? We also will apply pressure at each individual position. So once I've gone and pressed all the way down with all three fingers simultaneously, I start feeling at the swim position. Superficial, mid-level, deep. And then I'll go to the guan position. I'll feel superficial, middle, and deep. And then finally at the chur position. Superficial, middle, and deep. And you'll even you'll even see practitioners sort of move around on side to side on the artery too to get a sense of its contours. And I'm going to demonstrate that in a couple of minutes here to show you what that's like. Okay. You definitely want to have adequate time for uh, pulse diagnosis. It doesn't help to hurry through it. Okay? That won't give you uh, sufficient information. You want to spend a couple of minutes, ideally, yeah, for a full, complete pulse diagnosis. Right? A couple of things that we, we keep in mind when we're um, doing pulse diagnosis is that the different seasons can impact the quality of the pulse. Okay? During springtime, we tend to see more wiriness in the pulse. Well, what is a wiry pulse? <laughs> well, the classical description of a wiry pulse is that it feels like a zither strain. Okay? It appears to be on the long side, although it's not necessarily. But it has a tension. It has a certain tension to it. Okay? And the reason why this uh, wiry pulse is, is associated with the spring is that that wiriness has a certain association with the liver. Okay? And in Chinese medicine, Chinese philosophy, Chinese medicine is all about correspondences. So organs, the different organs, have different seasonal correspondences. In Chinese medicine, the liver is associated with the spring, okay? where the yang of, of the earth is starting to, to well up and get stronger and stronger as we move into summertime. Well, that is associated with a lot of wind, okay, and is associated with the liver and a wiry pulse. So we tend to, to feel that more just normally across the board when people come in during the springtime. Certainly in the summertime, right now, when the weather's hotter, the yang is at its fullest in, in the year, right? So we'll generally tend to feel across the board, more forceful, stronger pulses. So even people who are weak, their pulses will tend to be a little bit stronger during the summertime. 
That's natural. During the autumn season, the pulse can often feel thready or thin and floating. The understanding in terms of Chinese medicine is that, uh, certainly in China anyway, autumn is considered more of a dry season. Okay? And that means that the, the body fluids tend to be a, a, a little bit, um, can be affected. So you, you tend to be a little bit drier in autumn. And that can lead to a thinner pulse. Not as much fluids filling up the pulse. Okay? The pulse can often be floating as well. Autumn is the time when uh, evil winds from the environment start to attack. Okay? And we start, that's when we start to get colds. Autumn and then into winter, we start to get colds and flu, right? The reason why the pulse is floating is our chi in our body is starting to go outwards to the surface of the body to protect it against these evil winds in the environment. Okay? Finally, in winter time, the pulse is generally much deeper. I come from uh, the upper Midwest, Minnesota. Has anyone lived in a really cold country? Okay, so you know what it means, the difference between winter time and summertime. You can feel it in your body. Okay, when you live in a really cold climate, I'll tell you, and as a practitioner, I, I, can, I can notice it. I can see it in people's pulses. Winter time, those pulses go deep, deep, deep. It's like, you know, the sap in, in the trees, you know, getting, you know, taken in deep into the tree. And then, when summertime comes out, all the energy starts exploding. You can feel that in the pulse. The pulse comes up in the summertime. So, we take this in all into consideration as, as we're feeling the pulse. We also uh, notice that you know someone who's healthy is normally going to see that their swimming position is more superficial, the guan is a little deeper, and the chur is the deepest. Okay. Sometimes it's it's reversed, however, and that's not appropriate. Something's amiss if that happens. If their swimming position is deep, but the chur position is more uh, elevated or superficial. That's backwards. Okay? Athletes, real extreme athletes, who tend to have slow pulses, that is not abnormal. Okay? So we have to know if someone is, is a real athlete. If they have 60 beats or less a minute, that's not necessarily uh, pathological. Young people, toddlers, infants are definitely going to have a rapid pulse. So we can't you know, use the same uh, uh, pulse rate for an adult that we would with a toddler or an infant. Generally, we, we tend to think that a woman's pulse on the right is stronger than on their left. Okay? And the opposite is true in men. Okay? But these are all just you know, general factors in terms of what we consider when taking a pulse. Okay? And they're not absolute. They're not always the case. Okay. So we're just about uh, wrapping up here. So today, as I mentioned, we have about 28 total pulse images or categories. You can see there's a whole long list of, of, of uh, names here, but there's many more that I haven't included. But this gives you sort of the outlines of what I want us to practice on um, these last few minutes, okay? Which is, I want us to be able to feel whether someone has or whether BAP has more of a thin pulse or a large or wide pulse. Whether her pulse feels more forceful or weak. Whether her pulse is more rapid or whether it's slow. And today, we generally uh, gauge that by looking at our watches. If someone is, uh, their pulse rate is 90 beats or more per minute, we tend to consider them having a rapid pulse. If it's 60 beats or less, that's considered slow. So anything between 60 and 90 is considered normal. Okay. I also uh, want us to, you know, to understand whether uh, to see whether Beth has more of a deep pulse or a floating or superficial pulse. When I have students in clinic, this is the most important thing um, I want them to know when they're first starting clinic. There are lots of other characteristics or categories of pulses 
that are important to know, but this is crucial. You have to know these. Is it thin? Is it pulse thin or is it wide? Is it forceful or is it weak? Is it rapid? Is it slow? Is it superficial or is it deep? Okay? So, what we're going to do right now, for anyone that, that wants to participate, um, Beth is going to sit in the chair here. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to feel her pulse first. Okay? And anyone that wants to participate can come on up and, and feel her pulse. And you can take, take some notes. And I want you to be able to, to do your best to clean whether her pulse feels thin, more thin or wide, forceful or weak, rapid or slow, floating or deep. Okay? So I'll take just a couple minutes. You, if you want, you can come on up and, and see how I how I uh, perform the pulse taking. Don't be shy. I'm not shy. So all three fingers at once. Thank you. 